Alice Witherspoon, who is a Brooklyn-based performer, teaching artist, and therapist whose work revolves around collaboration, improvisation, and character studies. She studied anthropology and theater at Princeton, acting at the Esper Studio and Drama Therapy at NYU. She teaches in the Fine Arts Department at Pratt Institute, where she created the course Improv for the Artist, and is currently teaching performance art at SOU this term. Her conversation will be moderated by Grayson Cox, who is our spring VAST resident. For the sake of time, I will hold off on uh, reciting Grayson's CV. Many of us watching know of his accomplishments, <coughs> excuse me, accomplishments which includes participating in our upcoming exhibition, Celebrating Wild Beauty, scheduled to launch virtually with the Shadow Museum of Art tomorrow from our website. Hollis has been in direct conversation and collaboration with Grayson for the past 14 years. Thank you both for this opportunity and back to you, Hollis and Grayson. Thanks, Scott, and um, thanks to the Schneider Museum and um, to SOU and, and to the really amazing students that I got to work with this semester um, making performance art who invited me to do a talk. I'm Hollis Witherspoon. Yeah, and I'm Grayson Cox. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you so much to the Schneider Museum, Scott and Emily for all the support. Um, it has definitely meant a lot during um, this uh, turbulent time. Um, and uh, you have been really supportive. Um, so, um, yeah, so the students here at SOU um, proposed that Hollis give a talk about her work, um, and that was um, supported by um, the Schneider Museum. And um, so now we are here, and um, we can get to look at the really um, specific and interesting uh, path that Hollis has taken over the last 14, 15, 15 years, years. 15, more than 15 years, 20 years, I guess, maybe, um, which is a, you know, when, when you're teaching students, it's really interesting to think about models and like who are our models and what, and how do we construct models? Um, and Hollis is a very unique model. And I think it, um, I'm excited to talk about this today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen now. Um, there we go. So this talk is entitled um, Improv for the Artist, and this refers to uh, not only the, the course and curriculum and process that I've sort of um, invented, not invented, but taken from existing forms and um, translated and cultivated for the artist community um, outside of the improv comedy community over the last, you know, five, seven, eight years. Um, and it also refers to, as Grayson said, a sort of like way of what it means to be an improvisational person and apply the principles of yes and, and uh, spontaneity and flexibility and sort of following the creative impulse over a span of time. For me, that's meant that I've been a performer, a director, a writer, a teaching artist and now a therapist. And this talk was a really cool opportunity for me to sort of like tie this all together and sort of uh, and understand the narrative arc of my particular story, um, which, is, which is strange and felt very circuitous at times. So, um, there we go. So I think that it's important to start every talk with an awkward childhood photo. Uh, this is me on the left, um, this pale, unhappy 13 year old um, that I grew up on a, on a farm in, in rural Oregon in the Willamette Valley. And I was the third out of four daughters. So I was the middle middle child. And I think that that's important to understand um, my path and, and uh, my like hustle in life at the middle middle child is the most neglected child, of course, because you're the second middle one. And then it's also, um, like plenty of time to sort of cultivate your own imaginative life, which I did. Uh, and from a very young age, I just was sort of obsessed with moving to New York. I remember writing a, a, a book when I was in third grade for a class assignment. Um, they said I wanted to move to New York, smoke cigarettes and wear high heels. And I've accomplished all of those in my life. Um, so this is my first headshot from when I was 15. I responded to a radio advertisement on 94.7 NRK. 
alternative radio station in Portland, um, for, a, for an audition for Carrie to the Rage. And that sort of started my acting career. I went to this audition, I waited in a room for three hours, and I met a casting director. And from that, I got an agent, and I started um, thinking seriously about what it meant to be an actor. Uh, when I was 16, I went to this theater camp at Northwestern University, and it was the first time that I felt like um, I understood the importance of being a theater artist. I was, we were not treated like summer camp kids, we were treated like real theater artists. Um, and I was in a play with this director who was a performance artist from New York named Roy Klemenhaga, and he introduced me to Pina Bausch. Um, who remains very influential to me. This, she's a modern dancer. Um, she, was a, she was a German choreographer and dancer who invented a type of theater called Tanz Theater. Um, and really physical and emotional and assertive. And the first example of, of people and dancers um, not, not acting the thing or simulating the thing, but really doing the thing, which has always been very important to me. Um, I ended up going to Princeton University on a, on a scholarship, and that was sort of like a, a total culture shock for me at the time. Um, you know, it's a very conservative, waspy, uh, Ivy League environment. Um, but, and I ended up studying cultural anthropology and theater and dance there. And the, the good thing about studying these two things at a university that um, for sure prizes economics and and science and political science is that we really got to do our own thing. So both the anthropology and the theater and dance department were off campus in these like crumbling underfunded buildings and they left us alone. And during this time I, I was introduced to um, really radical forms of theater that challenged the idea of, a, of like a, a beautifully costumed spectacle. So my professor Roger Babb, um, introduced me to Jersey Grotowski, the poor theater, the idea of stripping away any artifice and just using what you have. Um, I studied with Ze'eva Cohen, the amazing Israeli um, dance, uh, modern dancer, um, introduced to the idea of Boal's um, theater of the oppressed and forum theater, which will become really important to me later in my work as a therapist. Um, and I got to study with Toni Morrison, you know, doing an atelier with her. She, she barely spoke to us, but she was really, amazing presence. So, you know, when you graduate from Princeton, they give you a, a slip of paper that says for your college plan or your postgraduate plans, um, they give you a slip that says uh, law school, med school, consulting, academia, or other. So I was um, an other. <laughs> but the irony is I actually, you know, this is pre-recession in 2004 when they were hiring um, cultural anthropology majors for finance jobs. So my first job out of college was working as a financial analyst at a private, equi private equity firm. Um, so I took all my cultural anthropology and applied it to this oppressive workplace. Uh, I mean, it was and amazing. A, but a great job because it was a job that they let you leave anytime you wanted to go do yes. auditions or go do your work, whatever you wanted to do it. Yeah, so I would like, you know, um, help construct oil and gas deals during the morning. And then I'd run to like a McDonald's commercial audition and then come back and like change my clothes. So I always had a backpack of like an extra change of clothes. And I, was, I felt like I was living a many, many identities. Um, at some point I realized I wanted more training. Oh, and these were just some influences from college. Um, Chuck Me's Big Love, Wallace Shawn. Um, after graduating, working for a few years, I, I wanted more, you know, craftsmanship. So I, I ended up going to the William Esper Studio, which is a, a postgraduate professional um, program in the Meisner technique. So Sanford Meisner was the inventor of the technique. William Esper was his protege. And then my teacher, Terry Knickerbocker, was his protege. And the Meisner technique um, is, is around the idea, again, of like stripping away the artifice of saying, we're gonna tell the truth in imaginary circumstances. So the play is imaginary, but the truth is the actor's job. So it's the doing, not the acting, the feeling, not the, and the being, not the pretending, which I was really drawn to. It was really tough. It was very emotionally rigorous, um, very emotionally rigorous. And, uh, it was the first time that I was also introduced to therapy. It was not really in my vocabulary. Um, 
and to go back to Princeton, there, there was no discussion of mental health during that time, though we were sort of in the seat of like a hotbed of like addiction and eating disorders and anxiety and depression that come with like a really uh, challenging academic environment. So our teacher mandated that we go to therapy. Um, and this is the first time I started seeing a Jungian analyst and getting interested in the creative potential of therapy. Later on, when I would study improv, um, I was really drawn to the work of Viola Spolin and Keith Johnstone, who is a, a British um, educator and sort of disruptor of the system and um, advocated for the idea of play as a way to um, address dysfunction, which I think is amazing, systemic dysfunction. Um, if I could be in a dream cast, it would be in a Christopher Guest movie. Just love Parker Posey, love the characters they create, love the serious improvisational affect of them. Um, later on, I would go on, I, I've always made cartoons and this is sort of like just my personal practice um, and my practice for my family, but I adore the work of Leona Fink. Uh, she just takes like the most banal interactions and, and captures them so beautifully. She's a New Yorker cartoonist, if people aren't familiar. Yeah, and super prolific, I, I recommend. Her Instagram is amazing. Yeah, checking her out. Other just female <laughs> comedians that I'm interested in, um, the women of Pen15, Phoebe Waller-Bridges, Aparna Nanchala. Um, I love Ali Wong for doing two specials while pregnant. I think she's just brilliant. And that itself was a radical act, to put the pregnant female body on stage and be funny. When I think about like my art influences, um, Cindy Sherman is the first to come up. I just admire her metamorphosis. Um, Alex Bagg, which, who I was introduced to when a friend of ours curated um, her into a show at the Whitney Museum. She was like a, an, she is an amazing video artist from had this moment in the 90s. And for me, this is like, I was never allowed to watch MTV growing up because I wasn't allowed to watch TV. Um, but if We're I had, <laughs> I would have like, she, she made like the MTV version of video art, which I just think she's brilliant. So uh, you're gonna keep me on time, right? Well, we're three minutes behind. Okay, we're three minutes behind. So, okay, the first, you know, the first job that I got out of college was um, I went to a film audition and I met this artist named Delia Brown. She intended to make a film, but we ended up working on um, a couple long-term durational projects together. Uh, this first one, she cast me as a, as a fictitious artist that then made self-portraits. So she painted these, but it was as if I made these portraits of myself, examining the role of celebrity and, and desire. Um, and these, these paintings are huge. And yeah. we, we've actually weirdly been to a party one time um, where we walked into the apartment and one of these very large paintings was in the person's house. <laughs> and it was just super weird because they didn't know we were coming and you know, it was just, but these paintings exist and they're, they're like eight feet tall. It was, it was really exciting, you know, and um, as part of it, I got to play this character and I would go out with her, I'd go to openings, I would introduce myself as Chelsea, Chelsea Green and I would talk about my work and it, it was thrilling to me how naturally it came just to make stuff up and fully be this person. So this is just an artist video that she made of me, that I made of me, meta, 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 um, talking about my work. They're really ugly. Obviously, they'd never be worn on the red carpet with this gorgeous Dior dress. So I ended up um, going and I found these, these Emmanuel and Garage, which is absolutely hilarious and like sticks in my mind. Of, um, they did uh, in terms of like, the fashion of it too, in, in Vogue in like 1951, 1953, I believe, they did an entire photo shoot of, um, of these women in these glamorous dresses in front of the Jackson Pollock uh, painting. And it, it was hilarious because it, it, it took it out of the realm of what it was intended to be, which is this great abstract piece of art that stands on its own and made it into like a, a decorative background. I grew up in Oregon, like on a farm, so I used like my personal history as a way to develop the character, but this was definitely not me. Um, there's a hilarious part at some point where um, she shows me painting. I don't know how to paint, so she had to tell me how to hold the paintbrush as I painted my self-portrait. Um, so Delia and I, you know, she, she became a really important figure in my life. 
and a friend of mine and um, an artist I really love and admire. And we worked together over the years on a, on a couple of things. This was um, Felicity and Caprice. It's a series that she made um, uh, based on the movie Les Biches about this, this relationship between this young artist and the collector. Um, and the young artist eventually overtakes her and tries to become her. Um, so we, it was like play acting. It was like this, this, we got to develop this whole environment, this whole relationship. Um, we had staged these big parties in the Hamptons at these like extraordinary mansions with all these fancy people at a party. It was exciting. It was really fun. It was like dress up um, to the extreme. This is when I murder her and take over her Park Avenue apartment. So I'll, I'll, I, I will say that um, when I think about my work in terms of like it being an artist, I've always collaborated with artists. I've always felt very comfortable in the artist community, almost more so than, than the acting community, which tends to be um, very competitive because there's this feeling of scarcity, this feeling of competition. Um, there's only so many jobs for like brunettes who are five four, and you gotta like you know cut each well, other out of the way. And you're not responsible for the content. And I mean, you're someone yeah. who's been who is writing and participating and like collaboration of like creating the content from the ground up. And you then then these people would. Judge, judge you based on those very superficial things. So it must yeah. have been frustrating. It was frustrating. And I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted out of it. But what I was able to do over the years was um, partner with artists and like bring what I could bring, which was a, being a performer, to their work. So this is Birgit Rathsmans, an amazing artist and supported, supporter of mine over the years. Um, this is a, an early piece that she made with me where I played um, Werner Herzog and I... Um, spoke his speeches as him. My name is Werner Herzog. I'm a director. I've directed and written and produced more than 40 or maybe 50 films. It's not only my dreams. My belief is that these dreams are yours as well. And the only distinction between me and you is that I can articulate them. And that is what poetry or painting or literature or filmmaking is all about. It's as simple as that. And I make films because I have not learned anything else. And I know I can do it to a certain degree. And it is my duty because this might be the inner chronically of, of what we are. And we have to articulate ourselves. Otherwise we will be like cows in the field. Um, that was such a fun experience for me to feel like, um, To feel like, uh, I don't know, to say the words of this powerful, wild director and be a young woman just trying to make my way. So over the years, uh, collaborated with a lot of different people. This Red Door was a, was a huge community for me, founded by our friends, um, Joe Marstack and the Stackhouse and um, Jared Friedman. And Lots we, of collaboration. We did a lot of work together all over the country, well, other countries, this country. Um, it was just fun. It was an invitation to be a part of something. It was permission. Around this time, also, I was the culture host for a left-wing radio show. Um, thing is, when you're an actor, you do every job that comes to you. So I, I, I got to interview people about you know, creative work and the issues that were facing people and artists in New York. This, that was Hollis interviewing Jared Friedman and Chris Stackhouse and Joe Morstack, and who are the uh, founding members of This Red Door. And Noah Brewer. In the and Noah Brewer. And just like the idea of creating space for things to happen. That's what they did originally and continue to do. And I'm really interested in that. Uh, Zephyr Thrill is another like, dear friend of ours and just a fun provocateur. Made these wonderful performances that we got to be a part of. This is Grayson and I spooning in front of a Mike Kelly um, piece at the Whitney Museum while a naked critic looks on and all these things were happening in the background and someone was fake stealing a piece. This was a piece he did um, at 
for Performa, where we played strip poker in a, in a storefront window in Soho. For eight hours, we played strip poker. This is a collaboration I did with Grayson. Um, it was really his residency for the Center for Contemporary Art in Warsaw, Poland. But I, I came, we were trying to make ourselves useful and, and understand our place there. So we made these little vests, sort of like um, merit badges for our skills. And we hung out in the park near a sculpture just waiting to help someone. This is us trying to be of service. Here. This is another collaboration that, that we did with my brother-in-law um, and Grayson. Uh, it, it was a sort of like a sculptural interface commission piece for the Ethereal Summit in New York, which is a cryptocurrency uh, meeting. And um, I played a dealer, so I would interact with all these people coming in trying to play um, uh, games, basically. Game hobby, games. Yeah, you, you basically organized the entire performative structure for the, which actually implemented the games and connected to the people, um, which was, um, which became like really uh, challenging and interesting and uh, meaningful. And this was a social experiment because, you know, people paid $1,200 to come to this summit to do meditation with Deepak Chopra and listen to the guy who made a billion dollars on crypto sales. And we were there as like artists and in, you know, insurgents, yeah, we, interlopers. Um, so it was really fun to, to play that role and almost like antagonize and facilitate communication. So in the background of all of this, my, my real background is in experimental theater. This is what I've done since college. I, um, in the downtown, uh, and Brooklyn scene in New York City, um, working with a group of people that are, were like my family. This is Old Kent Road Theater. It was six of us, and then each show we'd work with other people, new artists. Um, we worked at all the plays, all the, all the theaters in downtown that we possibly could. Um, this guy down here, Eric Bland, was the auteur. He was the author and director of all the plays. So he was like really in charge, but we were, we were a family, we were a company. And it was wild and totally experimental and super weird. And we'd, you know, rehearse in um, uh, basements. Uh, here we are rehearsing in someone's laundry room um, or on a rooftop. But we, we loved each other and we made plays together in rep for probably six years together as like this little family. And, and during that time, it was interesting because I was trying to pursue a commercial career and making films and auditioning for TV and film, and then doing this like really weird experimental theater that I didn't always understand. And I was frustrated by that rather than um, understanding how lucky I was to have that family, basically. And a lot of, some of those plays were published. Right? Yeah, yeah, they were published and I got to be published as like the original character that I created. Um, uh, he used a lot of props, a lot of um, puppetry and like paintings and, um, but again, using the poor theater idea of just like using ourselves, showing up as ourselves. But this was a really collaborative um, group as well, right? Like, I mean, it wasn't like he was just coming up with content and that was that, that, was that necessarily. Was he a, was, was coming back, back and forth. Right? He was coming up in content and he's like, this is the frame. And then within the frame, we could play, mm -hmm. which was exciting and frustrating um, at the same time. I also started working with other companies doing different experimental theater pieces. 31 Down was one of my favorite experiences. This is a really amazing actor, DJ Mendel, that we did at the Bushwick Star. Um, uh, this is a devised piece that I make. So, so over a course of six months, meeting with this group and writing and creating little plays and then coming together and creating a whole play. And I really enjoyed that process um, uh, of creating my own work with other people and the, sh and the idea of like rehearsal and showing up. I almost enjoyed that more than the performance. I loved the process. So also around this time, getting frustrated with the limitations of being a commercial actor. And it's so much based on like what you look like, to be honest, at the end of the day. So I started writing more. I'd always written, I'd always cartooned, um, mostly just for the benefit of my family or myself. Um, but I, I started partnering with my friend, our friend Asa Gowan, who's an amazing artist. And we, pr we began creating and producing this this show called Start the Car. And we'd invite different artists and poets and writers and just cultural makers um, to come and make stories with us and, and share stories and, and draw. 
um, so for me, this is like the closest I'd ever come to stand up. I shared like personal stories that were written and performed them with my own um, drawings and cartoons. Um, this is a, when, when we got in trouble, when we were growing up, we would have to run down to the mailbox when it was dark. That was our big punishment. <laughs> Um, stories of travel. This is like a, a moment when I was in Zimbabwe and I accidentally walked in front of um, Mugabe's house. He's the dictator, and they were like, "You're." you're Paulus's you're family get... traveled a lot when yes. we were young, and so you traveled to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe yeah. during a dictatorship. Um, I don't know what this is about, but yeah, it was, it was such a great way. I, I loved the the exchange of stories and narratives that people came and we, all sorts of fascinating people. It was almost like giving permission to come and talk about um, their life and their work. Around this time too, the theater company had dissolved, but we really loved making stuff together. So a couple of the actors from that company, we kept making work um, and, uh, and thinking about the process and applying experimental theater to classic texts. So this is a residency we did upstate called the School of Making Thinking, um, where we, where we did a fresh take on the Oresteia, which is a very old Greek text. And I played the murderous queen Clytemnestra. And we did this like in the wild on this like cliff in the dark for like three people. It was very exciting. Uh, the next year I was invited back as just a solo artist to the same residency. Um, and I, I wasn't sure what that meant to be an actor by myself. So I, I, began just by interviewing all the residents about their childhoods, which will um, speak to my future work as a therapist. And turns out people really like to talk about their childhoods and, or, or not, which is also really good information. Um, and then I made a story, I illustrated and wrote a story based on that. And then I realized that the object didn't feel like enough to me. So I created a performance where um, I had them all dress up in nightgowns and I, I put everyone to bed and I read them this nighttime story. And I was, um, I was newly pregnant at the time, so I think, I think that, um, oh, can the mic be turned up? I'm sorry, I'll, I'll try to talk louder. I think, that I, I think that I was just like sort of exploring the idea of motherhood and what that meant to me. And I was, I was ambivalent about it at first because I, I feel like it, it must be said that like the acting world and the art world are not particularly welcoming to, to mothers and motherhood. Um, and there was a lot of conversation about how having a baby would destroy your career. And that's the reality that persists today. So I was sort of exploring like what that looked like for me. Um, again, around this time, feeling frustrated or limited by my options as an actor, I began to study improv. Um, I'd always improvise. It's my favorite way of performing. I'd done a ton of comedy. Um, I think, you know, Part of this too is like I also had this parallel life as a film and, and commercial actor. Um, Which has been happening the whole time. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I love making that, but there's, I love making films and I love making commercials. They're fun. And I love making comedy. But um, this is not really like an acting reel for me. That, that, that is like your, your place is here and you're not part of the creative process as much as, as other um, forms of art. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, I would love to respond to this chat. It sounds really cool. So, and maybe we can come back to that. Or should I address it right now? Um, I didn't see it. Sorry. Bad, bad moderator. Um, I think chat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, someone's response, someone's speaking about, about the, about being a, an actor and a, and a mother. And uh, it's, um, it's fraught, it's a fraught relationship. But I, I will say that um, when I had my child, um, I, I was, I was um, actually like very pregnant when I did my last like feature film. And I, the only person who knew about it was the costume designer because they had to fit my pants. And, and I didn't tell anyone else because I was so afraid of getting fired because that's what, ha that's what happens, that's the reality of it. And after I had my, my child, um, I got dropped by my agent and my manager retired. And I really, I really, it really sucked the life out of that particular strain of my career in a way that, that was meaningful, but also I think liberating because it gave me permission to, to be very clear about what I wanted and how I wanted to make 
versus just showing up and being judged and, and starting to take control for the creative material because some of the material i mean i remember was you were it wasn't that good no it was terrible <laughs> it was terrible especially comedy uh that was written for women by men I, oh god just <laughs> girlfriend number two uh, so anyway i started studying at the pit people's improv theater um, and I learned the, you know, the, the fun pit is sort of like the geeky one. Sorry to interrupt. But yeah, the, yeah. There's the a couple of different right. personalities. Like the UCB is like the professional sitcom, which is Upright Citizens Brigade. Right, which is just imploded actually in this whole time. But the pit was the one, the more sort of creative, inclusive. Suddenly, you're seeing all kinds of people there. People who just want to gain confidence. People who, who, um, who have never seen themselves represented on a screen before because they don't look like the standards that we show on screens or, um, or they didn't have a community. It was inclusive. It was, there, there, were, there were queer improv communities and, and um, communities of color within the, within the pit, which I, which I found very encouraging. So at the time, I, I started performing improv, doing improv shows. I joined this like all female team. This is me like nine months pregnant. And I love the, I love the freedom to be able to get up on stage and do a comedy show with women. It was totally raucous and, and funny and weird and strange and aggressive and be nine months pregnant and not say a word about it. That was exciting to me. Um, this is another indie film or indie team that I was on for a couple of years called Field Trip. I was also on a team called Modern Baby, performed all over. Did not feel sustainable as a lifestyle choice because um, a lot of improvisers like go to shows every single night at 11 p.m. and like don't have a family and uh, and they stay and they watch each other's shows and they hang out at bars and it wasn't really available to me after I had a had a child. So this is my friend Birgit Rathsman, who's a, a wonderful artist and director and animator, and she wanted to make a film, a western using uh, female artists, friends of hers in like Arizona. And she asked me to come and um, teach them acting. <laughs> and I, the, I guess the irony is like, I am most trained as an actor, but I have never taught an acting class in my life. But I was studying improv. So I was like, oh, I'll, t I'll teach you some improv stuff. I'll, this is really fun. It's very playful. It's, you never know what you're gonna get. So I started um, going to class and I'd take notes and then I'd go the next day and I'd teach it to this group. And that group um, grew and grew and grew. And all of a sudden I had this like solid, lovely group of artists and makers and creative people that would come and do improv with me every week in Brooklyn. Um, this is like one of the core groups that I worked with for like four years, five years. And we just had so much fun together and it, there was such freedom there. And we ended up, uh, I don't think I have time to show you these, but we ended up making a series of like collaborative films together. Um, a lot of which I did when I was pregnant, so I wasn't being cast in anything what, commercial. Why you show the top one? Or the, the, this one? Stalker. I'll show or, Stalker. Okay. So this is, uh, this is something that I did with, let me see, with, with Birgit and... Well, you've been talking a lot about this subject, but... Lorelei Ramirez. I'll just show you a short, short clip. So we all took turns writing, directing, producing, acting, and making them together. This Airbnb? Um, hi. This is 559 Morgan Avenue, right? I just got the keys in the mail to my room, and I still have them off, but this is it's apartment one. I paid for it. Julia sent them to me. I'm supposed to be staying on the room. Julia moved out last week. So you're Gretchen. Hi. <laughs> it is so nice to meet you. Ah, you look killer. I'm so tired. Do you mind if I sit down? Oh, snap. Mm. Mm, so good one. Mm. So Julia left. It's strange, because you know, I sent her all my money. Um, but that's cool, right? That I stay here for a couple days and you know, so he comes. Oh wait, your, your thing? The, you the thing? Your baby? He likes it, he's kicking. You're just staying for a little bit, right? You're staying for like three days, three days or something. If you want to, because you paid. I did. You can stay. Oops. As long as I want, that's so amazing. You... So yeah, I'm this like sort of um, 
psychotic um, Airbnb guest that takes over. Um, around this time, <laughs> Birgit had an, arranged for me to come to Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, which has this amazing, famous residency in, in Maine. And I started doing workshops with them. And then I started regularly working with them, a group of artists there, um, and started sort of establishing myself as, uh, as, a, as an improviser working with artists in particular. Um, at this point, I started teaching at Pratt and I created a course called Improv for the Artist. Um, I was invited to, to Columbia to work with the MFA students for mentor weeks um, several years in a row, SBA, Hampshire College. Um, I started working with faculty as a way to like um, build community and introduce them to a form of play. And I, I noticed- So ha actually having the faculty at these schools yes. do improv together as a team, like team a, building yeah. or like community building exercise. Exactly, and I and I think that that I was in this position because I am comfortable in the art world, um, and so I understood that these people were not going to be going to a traditional improv school, um, and I was able to sort of like translate and evolve exercises in the way that I find them useful. Also, borrowing from my acting, from Meisner, from yoga, from meditation, from all kinds of sources. Because um, because like if these people went to like an improv class, it would be really pretty different, right? Like yes. you were kind of a translator of some of the practices that you saw in improv comedy that you saw could be utilized or used um, in the art realm yes. or in a therapeutic realm. Yeah, and I think the, th the therapy came a little bit later, but at this time I was also invited to run groups at a residential eating disorder facility. and. And I became aware of the like implications of expression. I've always been interested in expression, in embodiment, in the physical, somatic, in comedy and relationships. And all these things can be highly sensitive in communities um, where mental health is fragile. And, and the stakes were high with that because you know, eating, eating disorders have the highest, one of the highest mortality rates of any, um, of any mental health um, condition. So, so I had to completely revise how I was translating and offering the work to the residents there. And it really made me think about, I needed more tools, I needed more scaffolding for how to hold that. Um, this, this also led me to think about, about how improv can be used in, in ways that are not necessarily about comedy. Um, this project feels very, very important for me to revisit now. This is like four or five years ago, um, my, our friend, Lior Chevelle, who is this incredible artist and architect um, who now lives in Israel, but he was in the uh, Israeli special ops uh, forces for, for many, many years before becoming an artist and moving to New York. And um, he invited me to create a piece with him called Protocols. And this was at um, Andrea Zatel's High Desert Test Sites in Joshua Tree, California. So right next door to this space, was 29 Palms, which is a huge military base. And they were actively running counterinsurgency training there where they, they had American military and then they, they would literally import civilians from Iraqi villages to portray um, these archetypes of villagers. And then they'd run in counterinsurgency exercises where they'd come in and invade the village and, and see how that went with real people. And, and the artist, Andrea Zantel, she bought land out mm -hmm. near 29 Palms that's li literally in the desert, in the middle of nowhere. Cell phones don't work there at all. And she invites artists to come out there and set up and do projects out there. So this, this was happening in the middle of the desert. And it, it makes me, um, so I came in as like the sort of director and choreographer of this piece. He wanted to be improvised and he wanted us to sort of take part and role in these different groups, the military and the civilians. So we divided up into, we sort of practiced the archetypes of like what, what it would mean to be the grieving widow or the man over 40 or the young boy or the mayor or the preacher, and then what it would mean to be military. So there's no props here. Um, all we have is uniforms, but we would spend days in the sun practicing like what it meant to load a gun or but, but the uniforms, arrest someone. the uniforms are coded, right? Yeah, they're coded with the names of like the, character that you'd be playing. Um, and if you're in the red one, this is Lior, and Lior and I would take turns wearing a red one, which would be like the joker instigator of the action. And we just run this exercise over and over and over again. And it makes me think of this moment right now of like the militarization of, of police, of, 
of the conflict between protesters and police right now and of how willing people are once they're given power and a group to dehumanize the other instantly. And I, and I saw that, I mean, these are, these are, these are artists, these are young artists that came to do a project in the, in the wild. And this and is, they were all, I think they were all residents at Andrea's Tell's yeah. um, encampment, you know, that she has there on her property. So I, I want to like, just offer a, a trigger warning that this is, <laughs> you know, this is, um, this is acting, we're acting, we're improvising this but it is uh, intense. pretty intense. Sorry. Patrol approaching. We come in peace. Oh, no. Let me skip ahead. Sorry, everyone. It's like, it's a little bit of a laugh. You were not on the Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you doing today, ma'am? No, thank you. No. So a little later on, you'll see. I need, I need someone to back her up. I need someone to back her up. Hey, that's so and there's a sort of consent between the actors that this is what we're doing, but it felt, it felt very real. It felt very high stakes. We were in the desert and these structures that Leor had what created. What information do they know? Did y'all get anything out of them? I don't know. No. But that nothing was scripted was ahead of time. We sort of prepared through exercises and then enacted it. It seems like it was so interesting how assumptions. Holding a fake gun, right? And like Ask her why she bought a grenade. Assumptions based Don't cooperate. On We're taking you in. She's safe. She's safe. So I'll pause this. Um, and then what happened was. Um, we took this to to New York. It, was, it became the project became a part of Performa, um, and it was then done in New York City at a gallery at Art in General, which totally changed the sort of meaning and implication of the piece because now we were we were not in this wide open desert. We were a new group of artists in this gallery space in these structures with an audience performing for them. Um, you can sort of see the audience there in the background on the right on the picture. On the yeah, and this is, and the audience at, sort of participating. So, like, there would be arrests made and investigations happening in the in the action, and then the audience would participate as um, as. There was even a moment I remember when um, the people out in the on in the stage sort of yelled to the audience, "Aren't you going to do anything?" Because there was like this horrible injustice, and actually, people from the audience like rushed in, like and mob broke, mentality, sort of broke the fourth wall to help people within the setting because they saw so much injustice. Which is Forum Theater, which is Bowell's Theater of the Oppressed. It's in it's breaking the fourth wall um, for the advance of action and social social justice. This is a man. This is an audience member actively participating in a piece in um, in the New York rendition. You are telling him what to say. I understand like what you said. <laughs> Why are you telling him what to say? Why don't you let him answer the questions himself? Why are you telling him? I'm the I'm the The, the tension in that was, was, was different and it was very powerful. It makes me think again, this is before I became a therapist and I understood the sort of power of stepping into role, stepping into action, stepping into someone else's position and shoes and how you don't have to have actor training to understand the power of that. Um, okay, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very different, uh, I'll just sort of finish. Yeah, like um, I'll, I'll show you this. Seven, okay, so this is, this is a, a piece that I started making on my own called Untitled Anthropology Project. So, so this is you doing your own, own work yeah. that you can fully control and you're not collaborating. No. This was a summer that we spent in Oregon. We live in New York um, and have and met there and have been living and working there since 2005. But this is the summer that we spent in Oregon at my parents' place. Um, they have the original dress-up closet from when I was a kid that I... Just, spent all my time there and they, nothing's changed. So I would, I would 
I was bored, I would go in there, I'd sort of play around with stuff. And meanwhile, I, I, I always write conversations down, or sometimes do. I have these funny interactions with people, and then I'll remember the dialogue and I'll write them down, verbatim. It was very important that I captured that dialogue. And then I create characters and, um, and little monologue videos based on these. So these are just some of the characters that I created during this time. And each one uh, has an accompanying um, monologue and so story. These, these are all representatives of a video, right? Yes, these are representatives of a video. Um, gosh. Different characters. A psychic that assaulted me in a Nordstrom rack. Um, a media executive. And so th th you started off making these on your own. Yes. And then um, Zephyr Thrall, um, you and he, you, the two of you decided to make yeah. some more pro versions because this I think I was filming back. them before. This came and from I'm like, not very good. And Zephyr's a, a complete pro. So I'll just show you an example of this because I think that this the expiration date on these references is fast fast approaching. Um, so this is a this is a, a verbatim conversation I, I witnessed and then I added on to um, in a coffee shop in Brooklyn. So she like calls me up like point blank to my face was like, can I help you? Yeah, with milk? Like, did you sleep with him? Like to my face. I mean, it was over the phone, but still it was like, really kind of like confrontational um do you take almond or hemp and i was like like i can't believe you're asking me this but um like yes i did fuck your ex-boyfriend okay oh i'm sorry is cashew okay and she was like oh my god like i'm having a territory issue and i was kind of like i can't believe you're doing this like i'm a feminist like i, I made the choice to sleep with the boyfriend i won't like screw over other people's you know women for sport and she was like well, i'm a feminist too and i was like well you're silencing my voice um that would be 480 and she was like she was silencing my voice i'm like that's a trigger for me and she was like really upset and so i was really upset and then like the whole thing happened we actually like have this really good friend in call um thank you so much the lids are actually like over there by the straw and I was like, my friend Layla like knows you really well from college, and like I know that you like, went to camp together, and like you didn't know that you were like actually good friends. That I was your good friend. Oh yeah, do you need change? Sorry, um, but like I just really like was so stressed out that we have this like mutual appreciation for the same person, and like how could I do that to like another person that I actually know? There you go. And then I was like, I can like I'm really stressed out. And, like I can't tell if like this is like my own fear of like self worth and, and value, or if this is just like something that's like being triggered by like another woman, like the threat of a woman. Like it made me think about Hillary Clinton. Oh, I'm sorry, I got like two more dollars. And I was like, well, like I feel really bad for voting for Bernie, and I'm like, I feel like actually like really guilty, and it's like kind of like haunting me, and I feel like I just need to go like Reiki and like you know, cleanse and like get rid of some like really bad energy, you know? So. Shit. So uh, I I just had so much I had so much fun with these. Um, I will m maybe just skip ahead. This is this is um, this is a video that we made with our um, collaborator George Scofas at, at our studio. Um, we made we were taking advantage of being in Venice. We were living there for two summers um, while Grayson ran the Pratt in Venice program. And this is just a character I created, uh, a sort of like um, lame yogi. And this happiness, freedom, but but this came out of you going sincerely going to yoga and and witnessing this kind of like bastardization of this kind of like ancient culture by yogis and this like really bad pop music that was yeah. like for yoga and this whole like, but but then actually having a great actually getting something from it as well yeah it was right? it was incredible I, I took an acro yoga class it was the only one available in venice and it was all italian speaking italian and acro yoga is the is the one that where you actually support another person's body with your own weight so that and it's kind of critical to <laughs> understand each other and I remember almost like breaking someone's neck because I didn't understand the Italian word for chin, like move your chin. Um, so, but we made this footage just because we were like, we're here, we should do something, and um, this is, and then we realized that it looked like karaoke footage. And, yeah. And through our conversations with our collaborator, collaborator George Scalfos, 
And, um, and then he was able to turn it into what really looks like a karaoke. Like this will be playing in a, in a background and maybe maybe someone would be singing. We, we haven't fully this is a future, resolved this. This is a future performance slash uh, uh, happening, I think, of, of karaoke. But this is the best part of a collaboration for me because I had an impulse to like make this character and go do this weird thing and nobody knew why. And then like three years later, we rediscovered the footage and that's <laughs> creepy. <laughs> so creepy um yeah so so i'll just end with um my this led me to drama therapy all of this um i again well these are all it's not just that though it's not like just linear for you I no like it's, it's not linear. so many tandems there there mm -hmm. are a lot of tandems and but there it comes down to some very simple things but I think the, the through line is that I'm, I'm always sort of trying to follow my impulses and, and figure out why I do the things that I do. And then when I, when I find something that's interesting to me, I really feel like I need a lot of scaffolding um, and a form to, to pursue it. So for me, it was, it was really teaching improv to a different community and, and understanding that there was so much more that happened with people psychologically when you introduce the permission to express oneself. It's something that's been a part of my experience just naturally over my life. I'm living in my body and it being expressive and that's my sort of like intention for other people and it's not always available. So drama therapy, I went to NYU for grad school. Um, Pretty recently. Re really recently and I've been, I've been living in this world. Uh, we created therapeutic theater. We learned about stepping into role. We learned about therapeutic improv. Um, a lot of things that I was sort of doing intuitively, but I didn't have the language for it, I think. And I didn't understand the psychology behind it. So now I've been living really as a clinician um, the last three years. Uh, this is a piece that we, that we created around, that I wrote actually with Spencer, my, my co-actor. We wrote a piece of, around the idea of chosen family um, and displacement. And we ended up taking it to uh, the UK for a forum on theater and health. Um, and then I also have been, you know, sharing improv and more therapeutic capacities. I've been working with veterans at the organization Decruit, which introduces military veterans to um, creative forms of expression like Shakespeare and improv. Um, I run, I like after this talk, I will see clients for the rest of the afternoon and then I'll run a women's therapeutic improv group, which I, which I've been doing for the last, um, couple years and I, I'm employed as a, in a group creative arts therapy practice in Brooklyn. So I, I currently see a roster of clients um, almost every other day. Future stuff. Um, honestly, I was so inspired by my students and the work that they made during the semester, the performance artwork, the videos they made, the discussions they had. And it made me like rethink of some sort of um, projects that I've been like put on the back burner or thought like, oh, it's, there's no juice there or whatever. I, gave, I was invited to give a talk on, on anything I wanted um, for, this, for this organization called the Link Link Club. And I gave a talk on female cult leaders and I'm really interested in them. I don't know what that means, but I'm excited to learn more. I also have an idea for um, a series of guided meditations uh, you're doing a show in September that I'm supposed to design some like communal rituals around and this will be really interesting to revisit that in the time of COVID in New York City in particular um, and what that means in September for the ability for us to be with each other um, and then the last thing I did you know I'm still working on this film uh, directed by Max Sherwood um, called Best Guests about these these two accidental Airbnb roommates who take over this house and it, it tells them to do all this stuff. And this film was entirely improvised by me and my co-star Patrick. Um, so that was a really cool challenge that I'm still working on. And, and yeah, and I think that living in the role of the clinician for three years, I, I feel excited and interested in returning and putting more weight into the role of the artist um, because I think particularly in my work clinically, you, you need to have the creative um, impulses and activities happening in your own life in order to support the work that I wanna be doing with my clients. So do you think that, that therapy um, can be art? Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, I think that I, I think it can be. Um, well, no, actually, I think art can be therapy. I'm not sure that therapy can be art straight away because I think that you have to be considerate of like the goals of it. And if the goal is for creative expression, then great. But but um, I think you have to be mindful. Uh, you you cannot co-opt therapy. I mean, it, it, it seems like it would be like, there's a lot at stake. If you, if you, pl if you wear the hat of the therapist, um, there's a lot at stake for the people interacting with you, right? Because they are yes. leaning on you as a therapist. Whereas like, if you are wearing the hat of artist, yeah, is it where, I mean, are there ethical lines in terms of like, yes, therapy? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that I think about, particularly when I'm thinking about my, my curiosity about people and my character studies. Um, the ethical implications are that I have to be very clear to delineate between any interaction I've ever had with someone in a therapeutic setting or context and just my general, um, you know, maybe less correct self who's, who's curious and who's, who's free. I think I'm I am beholden to a, a sort of ethical standard as a therapist. Um, and I also know a lot more that I didn't used to know and you can't unknow things. <laughs> once you learn about, once you learn about injustice and, and, but really learn and learn about like the systemic issues in, in mental health care and access and um, the way we diagnose, even like the, the laws, the, the, the way the DSM is developed, um, you can't unknow that stuff and it makes you consider people in a different way. So we can open it up now um, to questions. If, if anyone has any um, questions over video or over chat, um, mm. we can um, continue this. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll give a little space. Thank, and thank you all for, for like tuning in and listening. This was really fun. Um, how, what sparked your interest in female cult leaders? How prevalent are female cult leaders? Ooh. Female cult leaders are very prevalent. The cool thing is that, um, and this is where I got like really nerdy in, into my research and, and, and I am trying to figure out what to do with all this information. Um, you know, we have this idea of the, of the sort of coercive um, male cult leader of, from like the, the 60s and 70s. And um, I don't know if people have seen Wild Wild Country, but that's like a lot of people's reference to the, to the Bhagwan um, in, involving religion and a, a lot of sexual coercion um, and a lot of like female acolytes. But turns out there are tons of female cult leaders. And they're really interesting because their relationship to power as a woman is so different than as a man. So they're not necessarily looking for sexual favors or, or like to like have a bunch of virgins around. Um, <laughs> they are, they're, they're looking for a new type of power. Someone that's super fascinating is Teal Swan. She's like the millennial suicide cult leader. And she's known for being very prolific on social media and understanding the algorithms that will make you watch a video and then immediately watch another video and another video. So she works with, I mean, she's attracted a very vulnerable and very, vulnerable po population of people who are discussing um, suicidality with each other. And she's not a therapist. She has a wild background, but she sort of purports to be a healer. And she purports to um, have access to the collective unconscious of the entire world, which is bonkers to me. It's, well, it's so cool. It's really interesting to hear that because it's like the, in terms of the ethics of, of healing, yeah. the, the idea of like wearing the hat of the healer like, and, and how, and, you know, the one big issue in, in art is like, you know, can art be healing? Is, does art have healing potential? And, and who's to say it? And it, does the artist get to say that even? Well, I think the artist can answer that question for themselves. I think that was the first question that was posed on the first day of grad school, actually. But I, I, I do think it's interesting, like, how people have... Um, co-opted healing in their own way and 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 cult leaders in particular i gave this talk and i can't tell you how many people afterwards came up to me women saying like i could totally be a cult leader i could like have a retreat in costa rica and like do jade egg workshops and like have a following um 
It's both funny and not. Yeah, the question here, um, uh, the cult leader is mostly going after money, money and power. Money, money is certainly a part of it because there are these massive organizations that need to be funded. There's a really, there's a really interesting woman in, in South Korea who's I'd been identified as a cult leader and she owns, she's like a billionaire. She owns all this property, all this church property and land. Um, and she actually started a, a whole commune in Indonesia and like built a, built a whole city with slave labor. Super fascinating. So, I mean, this is where too, like my anthropologist comes in. I'm just like, I'm so fascinated by this. Oh, the question was like, do, do, do these leaders believe that they have special powers? And I absolutely think they do believe that and, and, and truly believe that they have special powers. I think that, that people, um, people love to influence each other. I don't think that's false. I think that's real. Um, Brad says, are you doing a two person show in September? No, it's Grayson's show. Well, I mean, um, it's a two person show with, uh, I'm doing a show with Joan Waltemath, who's a um, artist, painter, uh, living in Brooklyn. And, um, and we have decided to make the show uh, a, about uh, the apparatus and thinking about the apparatus that um, sets up conditions for power. And, um, and uh, so anyway, the idea was that um, we would, bring Hollis would be brought brought in to do um Something work special. within that apparatus um so yeah that's who knows what what shows are really going to happen um and what and what what is uh but i think it's important to to dream and plan i think you know like obviously right now they say that you know it, it's a one of the biggest failures is a fail, failure of imagination failing to think about how things could be um, right. There, I think there's a lot, of, this may be a total tangent, but there's a lot of, um, of creative um, rethinking about um, systems like even the police force. And that, that, that's like a topic that I don't think people have wrapped their heads around that we can actually rethink how we enforce, enforce justice um, in this country. And that's, cre that's a creative thing to solve, I think. But yeah, we, we have to imagine what it could be like and that's going to take a lot of different voices and um but there but you know the the apparatus is a is there's a great uh essay uh called what is the apparatus that um i think everyone should read i have not yet read it but i will if i work on the show i i do think that there's this is a time about about uh, also being creative about how connection works you know, I taught my class online, as did you. I run my groups online. I see my clients online. And it is, the interface has changed the dynamic. And I'm curious about what it will be like and how much we took that for granted to be in a space with people, to be physical with each other, to touch. Um, yeah. I think we're running very short on time now because there's so much to go over because so many issues, but um, so permission. Johnson wrote about permission, having permission to be creative. When I think of performers like Ono or Abramovich who gave permission to act upon their bodies, it was found that most people are destructive or abuse their power. Same with the power of cult leaders. Have you found that people assume positions of power when they are given permission to behave on others as they wish? Right. Absolutely, and, and there's, there's, um, there's a lot of choice in that. I think position of assuming power and then and then inflicting it in nefarious ways. But one of the experiments um, of the Lior Cheville piece in, that we did in California and New York was um, seeing these people in the service of art stepping into positions of power and inflicting um, inflicting pain and distress and othering each other and dehumanizing each other and arresting each other and shooting each other and killing each other. And that all happened in an improvised setting with like fake guns. Very quickly. Very quickly. Very quickly. And that was really interesting to see. Okay. Can I have a question really quickly? Yeah. yeah. So you. I'm curious, you seem like someone who has really occupied a lot of different worlds, like including the art world. 
And as someone who definitely has not, and I'm now in art school, I'm looking at like entering the art world. I occasionally feel really like pessimistic about it. And it seems almost like this kind of like pleasure seeking delusional space. Has that ever been your impression of it? Especially compared to these other spaces that you've occupied and like, how have you gotten around that and such? That's a really great question. And I think you, um, when Grayson was in the class the other day, he he had sort of responded to the idea that there there's this idea of like one art world, but there's like so so many. But but I would say to you that I am an accidental artist because um, I I never felt like I was part of the art world. I felt like sort of art adjacent through like my relationships with my friends or or things that I participated in. So in in a way, I like tricked my brain to never feel the pressure of being a part of it. Um, and then I could like make fun of it and like talk about how silly it was and like go to these white white cube spaces and and just be like and just be like a like a fly on the wall and like a curious person um and I think that if you if you put yourself in a position where you feel like you need to be accepted or let into it it's going to be really it's going to be a struggle that's how I felt in the acting world that I was constantly being like you know auditioning literally for permission to be a part of it so removing that that boundary for yourself I think and just like making stuff with your friends and building community and going to stuff and doing what you're interested in no matter what if it feels like part of the art world or not I mean so many of my curiosities and influences are like not straight up um art art world people at all I find that like tedious sorry (laughs) (laughs) I I kind of have a comment slash question as well um, but first, I just wanted to thank you so much for like taking the time out and, and talking to us. You're mm-hmm. like an incredible teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and as somebody who's like come into the art world from like psychology, it's really interesting to see just like the freedom and relationships that you've made and like how you've kind of introduced fun to us. And I, I mean, art is fun, but you introduced it as like, like freedom and in in this class we had like so much freedom and like acceptance from you and it's been like super like influential um on us really nice to hear thank you (laughs) yeah you can't take yourself too seriously i mean um, you'll never get anything done (laughs) I mean, I, I've made a lot of stuff that I will never show anyone because it's embarrassing. Um, but I'm so glad I made it because it took the place of what needed to happen or answer a question that needed to happen at that m- moment. Um, or piss you off in the right way. Yeah, 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 that's true. I don't, I, I, and I think fun is actually like really important in therapy and it's really important in being a creative I have another question if that's okay um so I have like especially before this term I've been like a very object-based artist like I've been a painter for most of the time that I've been like an artist and something that always kind of messes me up about that is like the role that aesthetics and like beauty and all of that plays in making like object-based art as someone who has never, it seems, really done that sort of work, your work is all very conceptual and all very idea-based, is there a place for, like, personal aesthetics in it, do you think? And if so, like, what does that mean in that kind of work? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. And and, um, and I, I 100% believe in aesthetics. And one of the, in, in, in developing a personal aesthetic, and I, I, that's the thing, like, when you're an actor in a film, you're always beholden to that person. Like I, I can have a style of acting, but like I'm beholden to that person's like aesthetic vision. Um, this was a this was a dialogue and and like challenge and confrontation that I had in grad school a lot because and this is this is where like the the fine line between art and therapy or healing and art um, brings up some questions for me because I was sort of like annoyed or like um felt unsatisfied by therapeutic theater that was like you know very emotive and cathartic and helped people work through and had so much meaning for them so much personal meaning for them but with total disregard to aesthetics and i and i I hated that because i thought it was a disservice i thought it was 
it was a disservice to sharing it with someone else. Like, and why does like theater have to specifically be called therapeutic? I saw, I saw some incredible shows that are highly aestheticized, and that's what I respond to as a theater goer, as a movie watcher, um, that have incredible emotional impact on me, and the aesthetic was part of that. So that was important when we when we created our piece. It was a sort of like dark fairy tale, and the part of the therapeutic process was like makeup and costume, and those are those are important. I don't know if I answered your question, Chella. I'm sorry. No, you did. That was great. That was that was good information. Thank you. <laughs> it's something to consider, though. It's it's. But, I think but it's I mean, important. is it quick? But in terms of telling, um, and and you know, her, to her point though, like. How do, how do you start? How do you develop and like, how should you think about building an aesthetic? Should you, should you hurry to create an aesthetic? Should you let it develop over time? Should you, um, like, is there, is there advice that you could give? I don't know if I'm, I'm the right person to give you that advice because I, I think about things as, as like being activated and, and, and moving towards something and, and experiencing something and then looking at it and saying like, what does that look like? Like I'm, I'm experienced first, I think, aesthetic second, which is not to say that I abandon aesthetics because I think they're important and I, I'm frustrated by people who think that they don't matter in creative expression because they do, they really do matter. Awesome. Thank you. I think that's Okay, we gotta call it. Th thank you, that was, that was great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, Thank so you, much, Hollis. Hollis. This has been a wonderful <laughs> term. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank and you. To everyone and for watching. And this was great. Yeah. So good to see your faces. Thank you.